thanks for staying with us. Uh, we have this uh, topic that I talked about earlier. Hospitals shun Hipp Hippocratic Oath and Law in Treatment of Gunshot Victims. And our guest this morning is Dr. Tui Mebawondu, Public Health Physician and Publisher CEO of Health Thinker, uh, Health Nika. Good morning and welcome to the program, Doctor. Good morning. Yeah. Nice to have to see your face. Yes, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Uh, did I get your name correctly? Let's try it again. It's Meb okay. Awandu. Yeah, it's all right. Okay, guys, I passed that uh, that test. Okay, now um, <laughs> let's get to to know what the Hippocratic Oath is. Let's start from the Hippocratic Oath before we go into the topic why we're talking about jettisoning this Hippocratic Oath. Yeah, the Hippocratic Oath was actually is administered unto every doctor worldwide at induction. When you pass and you now become a doctor, you have to take the oath. The oath means that you have to do your duty without biases of race, color, religion, or what have you. Um, you have to actually, you know, give yourself to, um, to the care of your patient and to, to do your duty passionately. That is what the Hippocratic Oath is. It, the Hippocratic Oath puts patients at the center of care. Okay? It puts patients at the center of care. And it's patient-centric in a way. And uh, allows you to do your duty uh, without molestation, without political uh, consideration, without uh, cultural or any consideration at all. So the ultimate aim of the hypocrite, who was actually um, the first physician at a, in Greece there, in, a, in the temple, what we call it the, the temple of uh, Apollo, was, was this in Greece time, uh, was actually to imbibe into every medical practitioner that tenets, that grit, that discipline to practice the profession without fear or favor. Okay, so right now, um, the, the problem is that hospitals are not adhering to that. Um, okay, let me not use hospitals. Doctors are not adhering to that because if I say hospital, it might sound like it's something else. The hospital didn't take the oath. It is the doctors that took the oath. Now, hospitals or doctors are not adhering to this oath. Uh, what does that say? Is you know, about the medical profession and uh, the well-being of the people who are supposed to be taken care of by these doctors. That's a very simplistic conclusion and it's worrying when we, um, at the press, at the level of the press and media, when we just say that doctors are not adhering to Hippocratic Oath. So, very simplistic because, again, for Hippocratic Oath to function, there are conditions, there are situations. Now, when you're talking about gunshot victims, let's look at the, the, the stakeholder in this, in this in caring for gunshots. Uh, one, uh, we have the, the society, the police, and the law, okay, on one side. Okay? We have the, the patients and the relatives on the, at, the, at the second pillar. And we have the hospital, doctors, and the health system as a third part. Okay, now, uh, if you look at it, most of the thing that happens to doctor or that the hospital that happens at the level of the hospital flows from society. It has to flow from society, either the law or the police or experience. Okay, those are the clear cut things, you know, that determines exactly what happened. Um, now let's look at this gunshot victims now. Um, we know that gunshot necessarily doesn't mean that the person is an accidental gunshot. Um, arm robbers, thieves, um, police accidental uh, uh, discharge can lead to gunshot injury. Okay, for the doctors, we don't know where it's coming from, but the experience in the past has been that police will harass you, you know, will heckle you, will fight you for treating somebody with gunshot injury, and that experience led to the initial um, demand that okay, if you are having gunshot injury, uh, bring your police report. Now, the, the new act that was enacted, you know, mandated us to take care of people with gunshot injury without police report. We've had, we agreed to do that. But look at the scenario. If police 
are the one responsible for the gunshot injury? Are they going to give, uh, you know, are you going to get them to even take the person to the hospital? Because they're supposed to bring the person to the hospital. We're not going to be on the road looking for people with gunshot injuries. Now, look at our society. The people tend to put another other countries as the example. Look at our society. The ambulances are not working. You have public ambulances that can pick gunshot people and then start reviving them before they get them to the hospital. The ambulances are not working. Now, the first thing is that transportation of those gunshot people to the, to the hospital. When you bring them to the hospital, the first thing the doctor can do manually is to give, if within his capability, because you have a part of referral, within his capability to try to treat, okay? Now, if those guys involved are caught guys, or in a decent environment, who gives protection to doctors that is treating person of gunshot injury? And the, you know, the, the act also stipulates that you must ensure that the person can, you must report to police within um, one hour, or is it two hours? One hour, yes, after you have said to the person. It, 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 apparently, there has been that all police station is like from here to close TV, okay? Or they deal with the precinct. They don't know that Nigeria is a country of large landmass where, in fact, you have to drive many hours, many hours to assess police. Even by the time you get to the police station, you may not even have access. Look at what's happening in Cardinal now. At what point will you get police station? Okay, if you want to trigger gunshot injury. How do you contact the police station? So now, look at, uh, using Cardinal as an example, again, um, if you choose to pick the person in, and the other, people, uh, the other members of bodies enter the hospital to retrieve their person, in, in that case, what do you do? Let's say uh, police or army, you know, uh, in, uh, you know, got hold of the of those bandits and they were shot, and then the the, the, the man found himself in the hospital and you are treating. The other band members of the bandit will come to the hospital, invade the hospital, and do whatever they want to like with anybody they see there. Where is the protection for those doctors that are or these health workers that are working in that hospital? You are not providing protection for them. Okay, even to communicate to police station, there's no even hotline that says that. Whenever you see a case of gunshot injury, this is, if you cannot come on time, please call us, put record up, send an email, with a, with, upload the picture on this place. I mean, we've not had sufficient um, interaction to be able to find different modalities of reporting those cases. Now, you want doctors to just come, they dump the person and walk away. The second thing is that the, patient, the police can, you can, I can only take over the person when the person is, when you say the person is stable, when the medical director says the person is stable. Now, while you are treating the person, you are going to incur money. You are going to, you know, because at the end of the day, we're talking from experience. When you incur the money, um, and you have to be compensated who pays you. The person will say that you are saving life. You are not supposed to be paid. So the police will not pay you. The government will not pay you. There's no insurance covering them. The family will run away. So the doctors will perpetually be in charge of taking care of the patient, paying for the patient, nurturing the patient, providing security for the patient. So now, how do you want them to be here? Let's, let's face it. Gunshot injuries are not just simple injuries. It requires a multidisciplinary approach to get them treated. A doctor may see somebody, it may be, appear to be a shot to the abdomen. You never know. The spleen might have ruptured, the kidney might have ruptured, the organ might have ruptured. You have multiple injuries that you need multi-speciality. Where do we have multi-speciality in a private hospital? In this Nigeria, where you move away from Lagos. So now, the, the, the big question is that the doctor will look and say, listen, I can give this thing, go for care elsewhere. And people interpret that to mean rejection. It's not always rejection. So the narration is, is quite skilled. Um, and people prescribing severe punishment for doctors in trying to treat a gunshot injury with that, are even considering compensation. How doctors going to recruit the money, how to equip the hospital, how to even create a seamless communication between the police and the health worker. What I mean by seamless communication, since if I cannot visit the police station because I'm busy, you know, is there, a, is there a phone call that I can do? Is there a place I can send an email? Is there a place I can upload? Is there a security for me when I'm treating this patient so that it's, it's 
person is a criminal, the other team will not come and grab the patient and shoot and kill other people and face more gunshot injury. So I don't think why I don't think I don't know why we just put law on a very fragile foundation and environment and expect the law to work. Well, I, I, I don't know about uh, a lot of other states, but I do know that uh, Lagos State has emergency lines, not, not more than one, uh, that people are supposed to call in case of emergency. I can see this as an emergency. Have, what is your level of interaction with these lines when it comes to these kind of cases? And, you know, just talking about in interactions, when this law, when this um, directive was given by the authorities, maybe the presidency or the governor and all, all, all that, people who made the pronouncements that you can treat without uh, police reports, what was your level of interaction with the authority to, to say all these challenges that you're, you're churning out this morning and what was their response like? Because the general notion is that, okay, you were comfortable with it, and that pronouncement was made. We didn't hear much about doctors saying, these are our challenges, you need to address it, because that is what it should be. But it was quiet, and everybody just assumes that, okay, it is going to be happening, and it's not happening. So what is the level of interaction with those, those in authority to air your, your, your concerns like you're airing now? Now, um, when you make a law, that's supposed to, before you make a law, you are supposed to call all the stakeholders involved. Before you make a law, you are supposed to hear some at least some hearings. You know, people who have to you have to listen to the perspective. You want the law to work. The stakeholders are not just doctors alone here. The stakeholders even involve the public, the police, okay, and the ambulance system. And where you are talking about, you are talking about. Um, let me just if I, uh, refer you to what you mentioned about. Because they have emergency number. Um, you, I, I guess you drive around Lagos and you can just, you know, validate this point. How many ambulance points with ambulance have you seen around Lagos recent times? Okay, so I will leave it at that. Okay, and then I also want you to try and interact with these numbers that you, that is being bandied about. You know, we hope that you know serves the purpose you are saying and it's actually very responsive, like you really point out, pointed out. Now, when you are making law, the first thing is to is public engagement of the stakeholders. Okay? Now, you, you, to what extent were the public engaged? To what extent were the medical institution engaged? To what extent were the communication system engaged? Even the ambulance people engaged in dealing with this. Okay? Now, if all the scenarios I have raised have been raised over and over. Even now, if I've not, if it has not been raised before, as as I have, been, this is not the first time I'm talking about gunshot injury. Okay, I've spoken about it as far as four years ago, even close to eight years ago. I can I can still get back to some of my clips in other television stations. Okay, are they not listening? Are they not hearing? So, what is the assurance that you know caught people fighting who wounded themselves? You know, maybe they are doing their scores as they call it. And then they get to the hospital. I'm, I am not trying to save the life. The other driver who came to the hospital. Who is protecting the doctor? Who is protecting the doctor? Okay. Now, if I, as I'm trying to save the person, why give me why give me just an hour to report to police? So what can I do in an hour in reality? Okay. If I cannot get to police police number police station, what do I now do? Do I have an email? You all have a dedicated num uh, line. You all have an interaction, a police community relationship thing. These are these are just the clear cut issues. How much are we now putting those in the public? Okay. Now you you see you have a health system that is virtually broken. With due respect, okay. Because what I mean by broken, if you are having about twenty thirty thousand doctors treating uh, 20, 50 million people, that how else do you describe broken system? If you are in a place where attack that happens uh, cannot be responded to, where the majority of the hospitals are in the, in the center of the town, the rest, you know, you have to really go distance. Where the, even the competency of the workers are those extreme places, because most of those injuries, let's face it, happen at the periphery, the rural fringes of the nation, okay? Look at what is happening, the banditry and the killing happening in Kaduna, in Safara, in Sokoto, 
all over the place in Niger Delta. These are places that you won't even see presence of police. So, is it such that, because again, the criminalization of that reporting, that if you don't report within one hour, you have to pay half a million. Why? Okay, you said that I have to wait until the person gets well, you know, um, before you, the police can interrogate. Who is providing support and security? When the doctors incur a lot of money, a lot of cost because of treating a patient like that, who pays? Why are you not looking at those things to encourage the doctors? And, and if the police can say that, don't worry, treat anybody who will pay. These are guarantee for payment. A lot of things may change. If police says that, once you have a gunshot, you will, will deploy one security officer to, with a gun to watch over you until you discharge the person. you see a lot of things will change. If police says that, okay, if you cannot get us within one hour, you can get us within a day. Okay, these are other means of getting us. A lot of things will change. Doctors were not trained to be hard, so hearted, okay? We were, we were trained to save life. But make those laws and conditions conducive enough for us to interact and save those lives. That is what we're trying. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying, I'm just concerned. I'm, I'm asking, how much have you engaged, even if the government is uh, negligent, they're making laws without talking to the stakeholders, on the part of doctors, how much have you engaged the government to make them know these things you're, you're, you're concerned about? Because they are the making the laws, obviously they are not talking to the people, but when the law is not uh, uh, to your advantage, you will have to speak out. How much have you engaged the government to make them realize this and they are not doing? Um, you see, you can actually you know, guess the, 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 the day, the afternoon from the morning. A lot of things that has to do with medical issues, how to get the best out of health care system, is, is up for discussion every time. How much of them has the government responded to? Now, secondly, the medical associations, different cadres of medical associations have been involving the gov government. It's always promises, promises, we will do nothing. Okay? How long can you endure those promises? And then, I, I have not seen where the Hippocratic Oath said that at your detriment died instead of not treating a person. I have not seen where they said die instead of not treating a patient. But again, first of all, we must stay alive. Mm. What protection are we giving to us? Even, listen, I had worked with the, let, let, let me let me lead, lead you a bit of my own background. I had worked with the, with the state government as a public, uh, in a public system, public health system for 20 years before I left, okay? One of my postings was in a, a, a children's hospital, the most popular children's hospital. And there, I can tell you, even in that popular children's hospital, when some family feels that they have lost their child unjustly, they will invade the hospital and tear the doctor's clothes up. We get the police, uh, I didn't get the police station, it's always stories. It's not once, it's not twice, okay? now. Uh, we can't uh, get his... Okay. Go ahead, go ahead now. We can get you now. Gunshot injury, what it means exactly. Okay? So, and these are the things. These are the, these are the core things, you know, we need to do. So, government is not even protecting the health worker. And they want the health worker, who is not carrying gun, to just, you know, be playing his own role eh, by obeying Hippocratic Code. When the condition to be that hypocritical is not, it's not, it's not optimal. Let us address those things. Doctors will do their okay. work. We have been doing it. But uh, a worrisome thing you said, uh, simple but worrisome, is that uh, what, maybe I didn't get it right, but that the numbers, even the emergency numbers that are given by the um, uh, Lagos State government does not work or the response to those calls that come on those numbers uh, is not good enough. Is that what you said? Before try I get it, you, you know, um, what you can do is simply this. Um, I challenge you to try those numbers at all hours, okay? And, start, and you know, feed us back on your own response. Odd hours, okay. Now, yes. uh, <laughs> yeah, um, let's digress a little bit from just gun, uh, gunshot wounds. There have been cases where people complain 
that even accident victims are taken to hospitals and doctors do nothing about it. The first thing they ask you is who is going to pay for it and a lot of people have died because in an accident situation sometimes it's just a good Samaritan as it as it were that will find you on the roadside and taken to the hospital and the doctors do nothing about it because they want a deposit, they want this and that. So what role does the Hippocratic Oath play in all of this? And do you have way, a way of getting those doctors to do the needful? Now, um, it's going to be, uh, you know, that will be not a common situation. I can assure you, it won't be a common thing that accident victims were taken to hospitals and doctors are not doing much. Um, now, I know that they will, first of all, in most cases, because, um, you know how human brain works? It's such that one fault that is found in you is amplified and, and, and pushed at the dominant narration. Mm. Okay? Yes. I, because I am telling you, I had worked in government hospital for more than 20 years before I left. You know, I have done the private thing. At any time, when a resident comes, what you do first is to actually assure that the blood stopped. Now, you need to be able to have experience of what goes on with those doctors and with health workers and hospitals to know that in reality, you no know, government needs to do more. And what about, because of course, right, rightly so, the issue of payment becomes important. Hippocratic oath will not equip your hospital. Hippocratic oath not honestly buy the drugs and consumables in the hospital. Hippocratic oath will not pay. I'm talking about private hospitals now. Hippocratic oath will not pay salaries, you know, and buy fuel for the hospital. Okay? Now, if the doctor says that I'm, I'm treating you, and I can give you copious examples. If I've been a doctor for three decades, I can give you copious examples you know, of what has happened, where even people that you take care of delivered, you know, about the baby ran away, and you have to be the one taking nursing the baby, calling police, taking the babies home, where people that, you know, had injury, if I'm everybody run away, they don't want to talk to you again. For three months, they are hanging out in the hospital there. You know, these are experiences that you should fit into the system and look at how to improve and better the system. Okay? It's not an experience to wake up and castigate the doctor. So for one doctor that, that asks for deposit for a, for a client of accident victims, I'm sure there are hundreds that will not go that. Mm -hmm. okay, even in government hospital. And then um, what, what is essential is that whoever brings, I've seen people it's the way that, that brought it, okay, don't worry, we'll find a way. But when somebody's not talking, no, it is, it is uh, uh, important. Important, it is important that the doctor do the treatment. I, I'm not saying that there are no doctors that will ask for this report to you, but I'm sure that there will be a very few in number. It should not be the dominant narration. That I can buy. So I can put my certificate online. But that will not be the dominant narration. Mm. So again, the question is that how do we now synergize and enhance, you know, those kind of uh, positive narrative in this space? Our our emergency system is non-existent. You can. When there's accident, when there's, um, you know, either on top of water, on land, or anywhere, look, you see our response system is actually, you know, the Lagos is emergency. For instance, in Lagos, the emergency services that respond, the, you know, those groups, they respond, they do triaging, they try to take to government hospital. And you see quite a lot of interesting response. When the train collided with bus, at Oshodi, we saw how the response was. When houses are burning, we saw what those guys are doing. They are doing wonderfully well. And the people they are using are still health workers. Where did you get this narration that doctors want to say that go and put deposits? We should be careful of social media trolls, okay? It's not... Oh, it's trust not me, accept. doctor, this is not social media. Um, like you say, let me just take you on your words that some of these people, there are a lot of people who will... Uh, treat without asking for these things that I'm talking about, but this is not social media. This is experience uh, that doctors will tell you that you have to deposit something or sometimes you're just left at the door there and all your good Samaritan work is, is something else. So this is this is something we have seen. But you have said that there are others that do not do that, and I take that. We will continue having the argument. We will continue having the argument, you understand? I will tell you, I didn't say that 
so, you know all doctors, you know, um, uh, always you know obey those Hippocratic codes fully. I said that for one that does that, there are hundred that won't do it. That is my argument. Yes, you that's what I'm taking. That's what I believe. Yes. I, I'm taking yes. that. That is good. Yes. But you that's said right. it's social yes. media. That's why I'm telling you yes. this is not no, from yeah, social media. The narration is to is to accentuate that singular doctor that refused to do it. And I said that no. So rather, if it's, if a singular doctor is not doing it, we should be able to sit down and decide that what again? What how do we improve this interface? How do we improve it? Okay, this interface. And for me, that's where I am. How do we improve it? Okay, mm -hmm. we can we can improve it by you know further you know um, investing in our health system. The first investment in health system is you actually human resources. Now we are talking about the beauty. We have to invest in our emergency response system. Our emergency response system is far and in between. We're not ready. We don't have emergency system. You can always always, always satisfy to that. But perhaps you are you are a city dweller. You see it, you experience a bit of it. Then go to the remote area. There's no emergency health system. For me, apart from Lagos, you know, where do you get really get serious people talking about emergency? In you know, most of, maybe few states, like the United States, how many states do you get that kind of thing? Where they set up a dedicated emergency health system and they are funding it, there's ambulances about it. I've, I've done, I, I, I was part of, of the people that, you know, crafted the second uh, nat uh, national. A strategic development plan for the nation. I work in one whole state, one whole state, where we look at all these narratives. It's not just there. It's not just there. Why not? Don't let us deceive ourselves. Some states caught high, few. The rest are just like that. I have access to the whole report. And these are the things we look to work in. So, first and foremost, let's build our emergency health response system. Let's build that. It is a multidisciplinary thing. You know, even the training on on um, resuscitation, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, how many people, if somebody collapses in that station now, how many of your members can actually do CPR correctly? You know, so that's, that's where the response starts from. You know, do we have a means, an ambulance you can call, for instance, and say, come and take this person, to general hospital, take this person to social teaching hospital or whatever. Do you have any ambulance you can call readily? You know, because even you have the ambulance, you have the people, the requisite to trade eh, to work that regards. So, you know, it is not just looking at doctors. You know, yes, they are the summation of everything, but there are other inputs that we need to work on. Okay, for us, for this Hippocratic code, and that's what I mean by you know, a kind of single eye narration that we're seeing in the media. So for me, it's going to get better if we keep discussing about it. But let us, you know, take a feedback from this our discussions. You know, let's take a feedback, you know, and then input it into the way forward. Police cannot just come and tell me that. Um, report within one hour. If you don't report within one hour, you have five hundred thousand naira to pay. Hmm. Supposing the nature of the thing will not make me report within an hour, <laughs> that maybe I have to stay for five hours. That's serious. Supposing am I treating the person? Okay. Um. Or that I have I have to face security challenge. Who protects me? Take this feedback. We're ready to work with the police. We're ready to work with the, with the general population. And most of the time. When this gunshot injury hits somebody, you understand, it's a very, very a grave emergency. I'm not talking about a gunshot injury to the thigh. A gunshot injury to the chest or head is a grave emergency. Nigeria has less than 20 neurosurgeons. Who's going to open it? Where are you going to get them in the first instance? Okay, you take to the general hospital, they are there, they're looking for the neurosurgeon. The man is somewhere in Abeokuta or somewhere far. What are you going to do? So we, we, we have to build that, that basic structure, basic requirement to help, you understand, the doctors to obey the Hippocratic Oath. Hmm.
Interesting. Well, we're talking Hippocratic Oath today, Oath today and um, we're talking about the responsibility of the doctors to the patients. That's why we, we're concerned about that. But, you know, um, if we digress a little bit, we know that the health sector, there's been complaints upon complaints. And some use these complaints as a reason why they are leaving the country to go to other countries. And then there is health um, tourism to other countries and none coming to Nigeria, except maybe someone is coming to the Babalao because it's a spiritual problem. But otherwise, there's no, <laughs> there's no tourism to Nigeria. So what are these things that need to be fixed? I'm, I'm, I know you've mentioned a, a lot of them in the course of our talking, but for purpose of emphasis, what are these things that need to be put in our health uh, system, the basic ones that will, one, make our people, the manpower that you have talked about that is very important if you want a health sec sector to, to move or to, to work, it has to be manpower and all that. So what is it that is going to maintain this manpower to stay in our country and work? And secondly, what is it that can be done to drive um, a tourism, health tourism to the barest minimum, drive it to the barest minimum, that is people leaving the country to go and find help somewhere else will reduce and then maybe we'll have people coming into Nigeria to get, uh, get um, health uh, problems solved. So tell us some of these things that need to be done by the government. I know you have said it in many fora, I'm sure, but let us have it here again. Uh, we never know who is listening. Um, I, I don't usually like sounding like this, uh, but I will see quotes uh, Professor Campbell um, in Harvard, uh, Uni uh, Harvard University when we're doing that course. Now, you, you want to change the health system, you follow the money. Uh, why? Why must we follow the money? Why must it be money? Because, one, health is capital intensive, very capital intensive. You have to put human resources, you have to build infrastructure, you have to do research, you have to give drugs, uh, you have to develop your drugs. And, but the treatments in healthcare is capital intensive. When you say, when you gather in Abuja and say, guys, give 15% of your budget to health, and Nigeria is doing the best of 5%, why other countries like Malawi are actually going beyond those things? So what, how, do you, how do you reconcile that? You know? Secondly, when you have a health insurance that is just doing 8%, after how many years? How do you get to know that? You know, because you, for you to build that quality, when you, well, also, also when you have the maximum production of doctors, for instance, in the country yearly, it's about 3,000. That's our capacity. So how do you use 3,000 uh, to deliver health, 3,000 uh, medical doctors per year to deliver health for 20 or something million people? Yeah, well, maybe a thousand of now, that will also jackpa. Yes, out of that, some of them will jackpa. So if, if you can employ me in your place, I will even come and work. Abi, <laughs> there's internal jackpa, there's external jackpa. Yeah. As the case may be, okay? People want to, because of that, pull and push factors. So now, first and foremost, train sufficient. Let them take science. Your, from secondary school, let them take science. When it takes time, improve your capacity to train more. Improve your capacity to train more. And thirdly, you know, budget for health. Because the, 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 the simple thing is that if you budget for health and, you can, and the local government can build primary health care center and run it, state can build general hospital and run it, and that government can, can run teaching hospital in a way, you know, and give them that, that, that uh, power to function, okay? And then you, your compensation mechanism is not just about increased salary. What are these people looking for? You know, somebody, some people just want extra money to have a home in a decent place. Give them mortgage. Use it to tie them down. Give them vehicle every five years. Use it to tie them down. Give them access to do courses anywhere in the world. Either on the or on the, You know, provide that because at the end of the day, it's a feedback into your system. Recently, government said that they can't, can't live of access. I think, how can anybody think like that for doctors? Because in reality, medicine is so dynamic. We are talking about artificial intelligence, you know, and generative AI in medicine now. All those knowledge you have to pick elsewhere when you do those out of station, you know, sabbatical, uh, you know, leave of absence. You need to pick those knowledge everywhere. Medicine is about eclectic knowledge. You pick from everywhere and apply it to your people. 
So now you are counseling that. Are you going to be using Babala or Prophet to heal your people? So I don't just understand some of this decision we take. Instead of us to be able to compete, look at Denmark, Denmark, from just one single drug called Ozempic. Yeah? They made max, the country made a lot of money. We cannot even develop anything in this place. So, you know, the quality of your university and education is important. The quality of your budgeting is important, is important okay? The, the, the kind of training you give to your people, actually update training to your workers, your doctors, it's also important. People want to stay here, they love to stay in Nigeria, but they also want to have that kind of environment to practice the medicine they want to practice, the way they want to practice it. So, I, 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 you know, they, it, they know. I'm sure the government knows. But why we're not seeing them implementing this thing? Why we're not seeing them, you know, it's another big issue. You can know, you may want to implement, you may, there may be capacity to, you know, not to be able to implement. But if we f focus on health, I was listening to Akim Miyadesh, you know, he brought to the fore some of those critical things. You feed your nation, you provide health system, and you provide education for them. A lot of things will sort themselves out. So th th these are priorities. Uh, when you say manifesto, having 100, 200 pages, it's manifesto of deceit and lies. Just four or five things, you know, will be sufficient to make a lot of change in, in your nation. So people know, I'm not the one to even just say this, but I want to just be through a you know, contribution to to what is known already. So I hope we'll get there. We'll mm. keep talking. We can stop we'll, we'll get there. Get there. You, you said something about developing uh, something in our country. We can't even develop and all that. I'd like your opinion uh, or what your feeling is about... Um, uh, not just orthodox medicine, but traditional medicine. What's the place of traditional medicine in modern day uh, health? Health, modern day health. Let's say so. What do you feel as doctors about traditional medicine and its development? What What we need is standardization of traditional medicine. When anybody has any any pastor in Nigeria, it's actually they are looking for uh, pepper. They are looking for money, not to do the work. I can tell you authoritatively, even in the care of cancer nowadays so worldwide, they put traditional medicine, you know, they incorporate traditional medicine into a lot of those anti-cancer drugs, you know. Um, you know recently, in Charles of Britain, had came down with prostate cancer. He said, look guys, I'm not going to use any medicine, I'm going to use herbs, okay? Now, you know the herbs is going to use, probably going to go to India, uh, uh, you know, because those ones, they've standardized their Ayurvedic medicine to a point where it can be incorporated into you know, the orthodox medicine. We, 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 that handshake is very essential. But for the handshake to happen, we need to develop that and standardize our traditional medicine appropriately. We need to, we, we can't just be looking at it on assumption. We need to. So for me, where, where we're missing it exactly is that we have not done enough to standardize our traditional medicine. And, and, and curiously, curiously, I remember um, one of the research done in the past about one traditional medicine that enhances erection. It was found that it was even uh, uh, Viagra, you know, that was incorporated in some of those so called traditional medicine. <laughs> you know, the fraud, the fraud, the fraud is actually, you know, horrendous. You cannot just imagine what it means. <laughs> so that standardization and checking, I, I, I get that is now empowered because I remember in the past years ago, they were still having challenges in trying to, to check to analyze the content of a lot of those herbal and traditional products. So, but again, once you don't standardize, everything goes. Anybody will sell anything for you in the bus, on the street, uh, even even in the church uh, or mosque. They will sell anything for you as traditional medicine. Okay. So, in, in the world nowadays, we are seeing that you know synchronicity, kind of you know handshake across orthodox medicine traditional medicine, or, or what I will call a, a, a mystical or, or esoteric medicine, where people use meditation, where you use relaxation, you know, to actually calm mind and, you know, and further make your other medicine work. People are, the discussion is ongoing and they're working on it, okay? Even the, the role of prayer in, in, in care, in human health, people are looking at everything, but for our own, um, we are still at level of magical thinking. We want it to just happen magically. You decree and it happens. Decree and it happens and not just not just in our medicine, it has eroded the politics, 
and the way our, the way we look for money let it just happen magically so magical thinking will not solve anything it's critical thinking that will actually solve anything we should be able to do our things and test if we are saying that um, this drug, this medicine this traditional medicine this leaves can cure this thing apply it now let's see how the result is do something like that we are not in contentions we are in cooperation we should cooperate and we are not you know contend with ourselves Okay, well, uh, this is a good way to drop it. I uh, would like to thank you, doctor, for coming on the program and enlightening us. We do hope that the government sits up not just to make uh, policies and laws, but also to look at all the corners that m will make those policies and laws to succeed, especially engaging the critical stakeholders in whatever they want to say in whatever pronouncements they want to make. It's not just in health. We've seen them make pronouncements in so many other things that we're just looking at them like, did they think it through? Uh, or did they just wake up one morning and say, okay, let me make the, people's, uh, the people clap for us. We'd like to thank you so much for coming on the show this morning. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, okay. We've been talking with uh, Dr. Tuyi Mebawondu, public health physician and publisher, CEO, Health Nika. And uh, the argument today was that hospitals have shown Hippocratic oath and law in treatment of gunshot uh, victims. Okay, he was giving us the reasons why these things happen and what needs to be done for this law or policy to come to fruition and uh, people do the needful. A basic thing and very important thing was security. And then a second thing uh, was who foots the bill and so many other things. So we do hope that whoever is watching right now, whoever is listening, will do the needful. Let's start from the basic ones and then we'll move up. And this is where eventually we're going to draw the curtain on today's um, breakfast. And remember our quote for today was that uh, health is a relationship with your body. Be sure that you have that positive relationship so that your body will stay healthy. And if it stays healthy, uh, that is the greatest wealth that you can have. You've woken up today and uh, it's a very important day. We do hope that we will all make the best of today uh, for our own benefit and to the greater glory of our country, Nigeria, and not forgetting glorifying the Lord who made this happen. Thank you so much for being a part of our show this morning. Let's do it again tomorrow. My name is Nyamgul Agaji.